No, uh, we're gonna do lymphatics first. After I get done with these slides, then we'll uh, have a blood type in the lab. The lymphatic system first starts with understanding what it transports to the lymph. There's a picture of when lymphatics fail. The lymphatic system has two primary functions. One is circulation, as you can see from the picture. The lymphatics fail, you get uh, severe edema. The other function is uh, immunity. The lymphocytes, the white blood cells, are the cell of the lymphatic system. So to start off with what lymph is, lymph is fluid. It's the fluid. Um, from, cap from the blood capillaries. The fluid that is um, filtered by the blood capillaries, not all of it is reabsorbed, and so that excess fluid is lymph that is uh, picked up. That fluid is picked up by lymphatic vessels and put back to venous blood. That's what I say in the third bullet point. Hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries pushes fluids into the interstitium, edema. Lymphatic vessels have leaky walls with proteins that acts as a draw to pick up lymph. Lymphatic vessels pick up the excess fluids of capillary from capillary exchange. The smallest lymphatic vessels are lymphatic capillaries. So don't confuse lymph capillaries with blood capillaries. Whenever you say capillaries, be sure you know what you're talking about. Well, anyways, that's where lymphatic circulation begins, at the smallest blood vessels, excuse me, at the smallest lymphatic vessels, the capillaries. And then they kind of drain into larger and larger and larger structures, for example, thoracic duct or right, right, right lymphatic duct. So capillaries pick up fluid and then the largest lymphatic vessels are called ducts. All <coughs> vessels will drain into two lymphatic ducts. The thoracic duct Um, and there's the right lymphatic duct. So these are the largest structures, only two of them are 
eventually all, all the lymph will filter into them. So elephantitis, which is uh, what this is a picture of basically, it's an infection of the lymphatics. And you, if you can't return lymph back to the venous blood, that is what results, is uh, excess swelling. So here's a, a picture of the lymph capillaries picking up the excess fluid from the blood capillaries. The lymph capillaries are green, and the blood capillaries they show <coughs> red to blue. And so as you pick up the um, excess fluids in the lymph capillaries, now we call it lymph, it's the job of the lymphatic system to filter it through lymph nodes and eventually return it to the venous blood. That's why it's a part of circulation. And along the way, by filtering the lymph through lymph nodes, which are packed out with the lymphocytes, you perform a um, immune function. Because by filtering through lymph tissue, you're detecting any pathogens in the lymph. Here's an um, anatomically correct picture of right lymphatic duct. All the lymphatics you see in this light green region drain into the right lymphatic duct. All other regions are going to eventually drain into the thoracic duct. Okay, it's in the thoracic cavity, in the mediastinum. So, the right lymphatic duct on that figure is draining is receiving all the lymph from that light green region. <coughs> so that's what I'm writing, receives lymph from the light green region. So refer to this figure so you refer to this figure so you know which green region I'm talking about. It's the thoracic duct, as you can see from the figure. It receives lymph from everywhere else, including cistern and chyla, which is re receiving lymph from basically your, the lower half of your body. Receives lymph from all other regions. Okay, but also note the cistern and Kylie too. Uh, I'll just list it. So I don't have too many anatomical structures to know. Those are the um, main ducts. You also have a lot of lymph nodes in different locations. Cervical, axillary, and inguinal lymph nodes are the main regions that you can palpate, at least. If lymph nodes are swollen, you probably have an infection. So no, boom, boom, boom. Cervical axillary wheel lymph nodes. Cervical. Axillary. Inguinal. Inguinal lymph nodes. Chili, that sounds good. <laughs> oh, Kylie, it's um, it receives lymph from basically the lower half of the body. Let's see. You always hear about, oh, did the cancer spread to the lymph? Well, if it does, it goes everywhere, as you can see from the picture, and it's not a very good prognosis from that point. So usually what they do is they try to remove the tumor, and they try to remove all, all the lymphatic structures with it uh, to prevent cancer from spreading. For example, I've heard if um, you do a mastectomy, it helps to sleep with your arm elevated because it, it's hard for the lymph drainage when you remove all the uh, lymphatics from that region. So lymph is, is very important for proper circulation. I have another anatomy picture here. I wanted to um, give you a close-up of the internal jugular vein, the subclavian vein, because it shows the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct draining up those venous angles, <coughs> the angle created between subclavian vein and internal jugular vein. Okay, that, that's where you um, 
drain the lymph back into the venous blood, contributing this to the blood volume. Let's see. Let's write that down. I'm writing drain lymph at the venous angle. Created by the IJV, the internal jugular vein, as well as the subclavian veins. They call that the venous angle. So that's the anatomy of where all the lymph uh, ends up back in the circulatory system. So I'm going to go back to the smallest structures, the lymphatic capillaries, and talk about how lymph is, is picked up in the first place. So what you have here is a picture of a lymphatic capillary, and what they're trying to show you are these overlapping endothelial cells. <coughs> These, they call these the, the primary valves. Also called um, clock like mini valves. I've also seen them called that, so no, no both names. What you're seeing there is like um, in the lymphatic capillary, this endothelial cell, it kind of overlaps. this one that's kind of curved. So there's a little gap between overlapping endothelial cells. And in the right phase, that, that flap can kind of like open. And it, it, it'll allow uh, fluids to enter. Okay through the flap, because this endothelial cell, it has all these little filaments that anchor it to the connective tissue, so it's stiff. But it makes the other flap that it overlaps um, capable of flapping in to allow fluids to enter. So that's why they're called flap-like mini valves, because part of it is acting like a flap that opens. They're called the primary valves because, um, well, this is the first place you allow fluid to enter the lymphatic vessels. So the primary valves. Now, once lymph gets in, I have this picture to show both kinds of valves. We also have secondary valves. Um, these are also called internal valves. So, to show you the flap-like mini valves on this slide, look at the top figure. So what I drew on the board is an approximation of that, where you first allow lymph to enter. Okay, the primary valves first let lymph in. Uh, they call this the expansion phase. In, in the compression phase, when things get squished as you walk around and muscles contract, you kind of like shut the flaps of the flap-like mini valves and you don't let any other fluid in. But the fluid that has already been let in is pushed forward through the secondary valves or the internal valves. Okay, so these internal valves, they, they give the lymphatic vessels a beaded appearance. And they're kind of like the venous valves and veins. You just keep uh, the lymph going in one direction. Keep lymph flowing in one direction. So 
So now that you have um, lymph, it, it's good to filter it through lymph tissues. The difference between a lymph tissue and a diff, uh, lymph organ is that the lymph tissue just has no capsule. But anyways, wherever you have a lymph tissue or organ, you're providing a site of proliferation for the white blood cells, the lymphocytes. And you're providing a surveillance point for the lymphocytes because you're filtering all the lymph through these structures, through these tissues. The lymphocytes reside temporarily in lymph tissues. And then if they're activated, they'll leave to patrol the body for uh, well, basically the bad guys. And, uh, I'll talk more about the functions of the lymph lymphocyte cells in Wednesday's lecture. But for now, just know that a lymph tissue is primarily a reticular tissue, shown here. It's actually from a lymph node. Lymph tissue, primarily reticular tissue. Look at the black reticular fibers. Obviously, they're, ma they're made by the reticular cells, but that those um, fibers create a mesh, like a, a cheese cloth. Okay, it's like a mesh-like tissue. Mesh-like due to um, the reticular fibers. And all the red cells you see are the white blood cells, the, the B and T lymphs, the macrophages, the dendritic cells. They have the immune function. And when you filter lymph through that tissue, you force it through all of those cells and if, well, there's an infection, if there's an infection in the lymph, that, that's a good surveillance point, right? you have a chance to encounter it. Because a mesh, it forces the lymph to slowly percolate through, right? You force lymph to slowly percolate through. And you're increasing the chance of um, in activation of your white blood cells. Increased chance of WBC, white blood cell activation. And I'll explain, explain the activation process in Wednesday's lecture. So I just wanted to show you what the tissue looks like. Here's a picture of lymph tissue um, in your gut, in the small intestine. It's called MALT. It's a mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. I always just go by the acronym MALT. So I just want to give you some examples of lymph tissues and organs. MALT is a good example of a lymph tissue. Mucosa, associated lymphoid tissue, it's in the intestines. I know we haven't had GI tract yet, but if you look at the general pattern here, um, well, the food stuff that's being digested flows along the top and you're looking at the GI tract wall here with a big purple splotch. That's the malt. When you force um, the food stuff, which is being absorbed through the lymph tissue, it percolates through and it exits this side. So we call that efferent lymphatics. Fluids that have filtered through a lymph tissue. And that's good because, again, you're trying to like detect um, pathogens on the Fuji. Okay. So let me know. That means the lip has been filtered, right? E fair. It's on the way out. has been filtered by the tissue. I also 
watching this PBS documentary and they showed a dingy bathroom and all these flies buzzing around. And they showed those flies landing on this person's jam toast, really close up. And then they show real close up the guy eating the jam toast. Always thought, yeah, this is why we need lymphatics, right? You got germs on your food. Uh, we need a defense mechanism in our digestive tract. You have lymph tissue in your mouth, your, your um, adenoids, right? I'll teach the tonsils later when we get into the whole cavity and digestion. There are other places you have lymph tissue. This is one example. Let's talk about some lymph organs. And the only difference is you have lymph tissue with a capsule around it. Let's talk about the structure of the lymph node. For example, I said you had cervical, inguinal, axillary lymph nodes. This is just one lymph node. And what you see here is a lymph node cut open. And there's some organization here. You better know. So pay attention to the left side. That is where you have some, uh, a few incoming afferent lymphatics. Lymph coming in. Coming in on this side. You're going to percolate through from cortex out here to medulla. Notice how the capsule, it folds in um, on this, what they call it, trabeculae. And by folding in, you create all these little compartments called follicles. So let me write that down. Lymph node structure. There's a capsule present. Capsule folds in. Uh, they call it trabeculae. it create um, follicle, lymphoid follicles in the cortex. It creates lymphoid follicles in the cortex region. It's the cortex that is receiving the afferent lymphatics coming in, needs to be filtered. Receives afferent lymphatics. All right, so once you get in, now you have to percolate through the lymph tissue. And so these lymph follicles, well, the presence of a lymph follicle indicates an activated lymph node. Because in there you have this germinal center where all of your white blood cells are proliferating. Move that down. So. Okay, so this thing here, the lymphoid follicle in the cortex, I'll put it as a side note, indicates an activated uh, lymph node. Okay, back to the afferent lymphatics. Uh, once the lymph comes in into the follicles, it, um, it flows through, but it has a choice. Afferent lymph. Okay, it flows in, it flows through cortex region. has a choice. Number one, it can flow through the follicle, which is desirable. That's where your white blood cells are. Flow through follicle. The follicle, that's where all your white blood cells are. The B, the B cells, the T cells, the macrophages. That's, this is my shorthand for macrophage, this little M phage. So BT, basically white blood cells. So you want that if there's an infection there. But it doesn't have to, it can flow around it. There's these little 
side channels where it can bypass the follicle. They, they call them <coughs> trabecular sinus. So they basically just flow through or flow around. So if you flow around, you're flowing through the trabecular sinus. There's no white blood cells in it. Number two, flow around. Flow around follicle um, via trabecular sinus. So if you're a, a pathogen and you flow around, I guess you got by. Okay. But then you have to go through the uh, medulla region, which has these medullary cords. And the medullary cords are packed out with primarily the T cells. So you get to the, um, I'll say medulla. Limb, again, has a choice. Um, it can flow through number one, what's called the medullary cord. Again, sometimes I believe in a T cell, I should put a T and a circle. Those are white blood cells. I'll, I'll teach you the function of them later. Just know that they're your some of your defensive cells. Or you can flow around. Number two, the medullary sinus. So they're pointing to you can flow through the sinus or you can flow through the cord. So if you're fighting infection, what's desirable? One, one or two? One, where you have T cells. Of course, you can make it through the whole gauntlet, flow around, flow around, and go right on out, the efferent lymphatics. So after you get through the cortex and the medulla, then you're on the way out. So again, here's efferent lymphatics. I don't want to write that on the board again. I already wrote efferent lymphatics on the board. But think about it. You have a bunch of lymph nodes in a row. So Let's say you're a pathogen, you make it through this gauntlet, and then you make it through here, and then, yeah, you, 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 you're done, you escape. But then you gotta go through another one. And you just keep going through and through. You double filter, you triple filter this stuff, and uh, by the time it gets back to um, your blood, if there's an infection, you, you've probably triggered an immune response by then. Okay. So, what you should notice, uh, lymph nodes, you know, they're the only lymph organ that actually receive efferent lymphatics. But that has another note here. Only structure <coughs> to receive efferent lymphatics. They receive lymph that's already been filtered. Let's filter it again. Well, you know, blood actually has something that filters the blood for blood-borne pathogens, just like lymph nodes filter for lymph. And that's the spleen. And so the spleen is the largest lymphoid mass of um, tissue in the body. And the lymph node is to lymph as spleen is to blood. The spleen fights anything that's blood-borne in terms of it being an infection. Because it's filtering the blood, it can remove blood cells, including the platelets. It can store old, dead, dying RBCs and kind of recycle the iron, things like that. And Well, I'm gonna focus on this last point. It has an immune function because of all the lymph tissue in it. So it's not much to look at there. It's just basically on the left side of the stomach. It's intraperitoneal, it's very <coughs> easy to find. Um, so I want you to know where it is anatomically. Left of stomach. So you clear the board here.
located left of stomach, it's intraperitoneal. No, the splenic artery in vein. That's why I put the picture on the on the right end. You, you can remove the stomach and get a clear view of the splenic artery and vein. It, it's receiving a lot of blood. It's filtering it all. And so that's where it is anatomically. Um, in terms of um, its function, if you cut it open, you see red pulp and white pulp. Just its appearance on a fresh dissection. The red pulp is all the red blood cell blood just kind of um, recycling the old parts. Let's focus more on the white pulp. That's the immune function. That's where the white blood cells are. Now, it doesn't stain white. Uh, white pulp stains purple. I think this is the better slide to look at. This one here. See the white pulp? and then it surrounds more or less a central arterial. So basically you're, you're surrounding the blood coming in. And in doing so, if there's a blood-borne infection, you're gonna be able to fight it. You're, you're just lining, lining the blood vessels uh, with the white blood cells in. So, so this figure um, actually shows better how blood circulates through the spleen. This is on the previous slide. Here's our white pulp. Here's our white pulp here. Um, and they name it PALS. So the white pulp is PALS, this uh, periarteriolar lymphoid sheath. sheath around a central artery, a central arteriole. PALS surrounds Uh, whenever I present this slide, I'm always reminded of a, a story. <laughs> uh, I told my morning class, I guess I'll tell you guys too. When I was in high school, I used to run track. I remember there's this guy named Keith who always used to work out with us. He wasn't on the team, but he used to work train with us. And uh, you know, Keith was a former gang member. And he was in the gang that wore the blue stuff. And I remember one day, my track coach, Dave, he told me he gave Keith a ride home in South Stockton. And he turned down the wrong street the street where the guys wear the red stuff. And Dave was like, Keith got scared. And he got down and he hid. And they had the streets lined, the guys that wear the red stuff. And he drove real slow and careful, because if they saw Keith, they're going to kill him. You know what I'm talking about? It's like Stouts talking. <laughs> well, anyways, I always think of this. Because this is like that. If you're a bloodborne pathogen, this is the wrong street. And you're, you know, you want to get killed. So I always think of that image. Uh, true story. It ended well. That my coach is kind of like this. Um, he's a Filipino guy. He's let him go through. Uh, but Keith was scared. I think I think that story turned out okay. But in terms of the spleen, what it's supposed to do, if there's a bloodborne pathogen here, you you put it through this this street lined with the white blood cells. Okay, and that's how you fight the infection for the spleen. And so let, let's kind of go through this. Let's back it up here. It starts with the splenic artery, SA. Let's call this um, splenic circulation. <coughs> okay, so splenic artery, let's start with that. SA is splenic artery. But notice how it branches and it branches and it branches to the smaller arteries. So, so that capital A is like our central arterial. The 
okay, this is what is surrounded by the pals. It's within the pals. That's how you fight infection. Now, even look at these little branches coming off the arterial. These are all, it says PA, 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 PA. That stands for penicillary artery. They're even smaller. Penicillary artery. Let me try to spell it right. Yeah. So we go through the PA. Penicillary artery. And what those are leading to are these special capillaries. They're, they're sheathed, sheathed capillaries, SC. So those flow straight to the SC, which stands for a sheathed capillary. So this is what makes splenic circulation very unusual. Splenic circulation is an example of what's called open circulation. In other words, it's not closed. Closed circulation is regular blood flow. Arteries, capillaries, veins, back to the heart. Arteries, capillaries, veins, back to the heart. There's no gap between blood vessels. But here there is. There's a gap between the sheathed capillary and this S, which stands for splenic sinusoid. That's the venous blood. So there's a little gap there. So this is unusual because the sheathed capillary, it's like a dead end. And um, then it's sheathed with macrophages. <clears throat> the number one phagocytes. So these sheath capillaries, they perform a filtration function. You filter all the blood through it. Think about it. Um, if you're a bloodborne infection, you got to flow through the white blood, um, all the white blood cells surrounding you. Then you have to filter through this capillary, which is lined with macrophages. And so uh, it, it's likely you'll have an, uh, an activation there if there's a bloodborne pathogen. So once you get out of the sheath capillary, you're actually in the spleen where they, where they put RP, red pole. I mean, it's everywhere that's outside. Okay. And the thing is, if you're a red blood cell, if you're a younger red blood cell, you're more uh, flexible. And younger flexible cells can kind of squeeze through back into the venous blood. The average lifespan of an RBC is about 120 days. So the older ones get more stiff and rigid, and they can't squeeze through and get back in. So where are they? They're stuck. I call this the red blood cell graveyard, right? It's just kind of go to die, retire. They can't get back into the blood. So um, let's pick it up from here. So once you filter through, I'll continue up here. So I'll continue from there up here filter through SC, then you're in the RP, the red pole. Only young RBCs can make it back into the splenic sinusoids. Only younger RBCs make it back into the venous blood, or in this case, the splenic sinusoids. Those, those are the blood vessels. The splenic sinusoids, the, the, the blue colored thing here, they'll drain all the way back and all the way out through the splenic vein. Here's another view of the sheath capillary and the red pulp. Um, the SC, the yellow, is the sheath capillary you filter through. They call NFA a non-filtering area, pretty much where you don't have the SC. 
And if you're a young red blood cell, you go right through, you traverse this gap, and you make it back into the venous blood. If you're kind of older and you're too stiff to make it through that vessel wall, you just stay here, be a part of the permanent, you're a permanent resident, right? The red pulp. You just recycle all the, the parts like iron. You can read more about splenic pulp if you want to. I just kind of want you to know that, that. This is why it's open. The gap between the capillary and the vein right there. Okay. Normally, there's no gap between capillary and vein. So I know there's a lot of terms there. Uh, was there any questions on this slide? About the PALS, the white pole, all the different blood vessels. Okay, I'm gonna move on then. Uh, the other organ we like to you know is, is the thymus. There's a picture of it in a young two-year-old. It kind of shrivels in adults as the T cells mature. But this is kind of um, why T cells are called T cells. Uh, they mature in the thymus. It's actually a selection process. So you have cortex medulla um, pretty much for the thymus, the cortex region. On the slide, it, it's the darker staining region. I think what you need to know about that is um, there are reticular epithelial cells. They produce these cytokines to help the maturation process. I more want you to know that uh, the epithelial cells, they, they form, these reticular cells form a blood thymus barrier in the cortex. Reticular epithelial cells form a blood thymus barrier. So what you're doing is you're protecting these immature T cells from being prematurely activated by anything that's in the blood. That's why you need a barrier. Uh, I'll say prevent. Premature activation of immature T cells. What, what the um, thymus does, it kind of has two rounds of selection to get the ones that are immunocompetent. And those are the ones that are allowed to enter the medulla, the lighter staining region. There's, there's no blood thymus barrier in the medulla. And then so th those immunocompetent T cells, after two rounds of selection, will be allowed to migrate from cortex to medulla and enter the blood. So cortex, this is where this quote-unquote T-cell education occurs. I'll just describe what I, what I keep saying, the two rounds of selection. And if you make it through both rounds, then you're quote-unquote immunocompetent. <clears throat> Okay, so let's talk about what I have in the middle there, the T-cell education process. 
We call it a development of self-tolerance. This will kind of be a good precursor to Wednesday's lecture. It's one round of positive selection and one round of negative selection. So let's kind of table this out. Cell education, a development of self tolerance. If your immune cells are going to work effectively, they have to be able to tell self from non self. Anything molecule, cell, protein, that's self versus non self. Um, so there's a couple questions you can ask here. Let's say for round one, we call this positive selection. Plus <coughs> positive selection. You're, at, you're answering this question. Does the T cell react to MHC1? <coughs> It's a yes-no question. Yes or no. Now, before I answer it, um, let me explain what MHC is. It stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex 1. Major Histocompatibility Complex one. There, there's two. We're just talking about one. We'll talk about two later. Um, so, uh, just a little bit of history about these, these MHC. They're called different things. I call them MHC in my lectures. Um, they did a lot of research on this in mice. And um, the mouse model, these inbred strains, they've provided a, a great model for a lot of uh, medical reasons. And so, inbred strains is you just take two mice. And you mate them, you cross them. And they give a litter of mice, a bunch of brother and sister mice. But then you, you, you um, inbreed the mice. So the brothers and sisters, they cross, and they have another generation. I mean, you could do this with mice, right? You keep crossing them. But the thing is, it doesn't matter how, how many times you cross them. The, the, the entire strain, no matter how many generations you do, is genetically homogenous because it's all from the same two parents, right? So let's say you have one strain and then you have another inbred strain. You have two different strains. Um, if you stay within a strain, and let's say you try to do a tissue graft from one mouse to another mouse in the same strain, do you think that tissue graft is accepted from mouse to mouse within a strain? Yes or no? Now the answer is yes. It's genetic, genetically homogenous. It doesn't matter who you give to within the strain. Um, the tissue graft is accepted. What happens if, um, what do you think happens if you take a tissue graft from one mouse <coughs> from a strain and give it to another mouse in another strain? Is that tissue graft accepted or rejected? It would be rejected. So that's your model, right? You give one graft from strain to strain. And what they tried to do is, they tried to find the genes responsible for the tissue graft rejection. So that's the research question. So what they found was that the complex of genes responsible for the tissue graft rejection, they, they called it histocompatibility histo complex. What does histo mean? Tissue. Tissue. And so further research showed um, the most potent complex of genes responsible for the tissue graft rejection, they called MHC. So that's what we're talking about here. 
So it's very important, right? I mean, we're talking about self versus non-self. This is why you talk about it when you talk about your immune cells. That's what your cells have to do. Okay, so that's where that uh, comes from. So we're talking about MHC1. So think about this. Okay, your immune system has to have the ability to recognize you, self. So we want that. Yes is good. So if it interacts with MHC1, if you're a T cell, you're, you're kind of auditioning, right? And, well, yes, you can interact with that. Those cells live. I'll say lives. If they can't, well, you're not going to be able to recognize self from non-self, so those cells undergo uh, programmed cell death, um, death, apoptosis. The cells that can react with MHC1, they, they live and they're... Um, they proceed to the second round. Now the second round is a round of negative selection. And you ask the question, um, well does the T cell react to a self antigen? This is something different. So you have certain cells, um, most cells have this MHC1. This is like signals your immune system that this is you, okay? But they always, um, they have these two groups. In this group, they always present some kind of piece of a molecule, usually from your cells. A red ball. So maybe this red ball is the self antigen, okay, in my example. If you're a T cell, making it through these auditions, these rounds of selection, you gotta have a T cell receptor that can interact with MHC1. So I'm just gonna call this big receptor TCR for T cell receptor. And there's usually other uh, membrane proteins like uh, called C8 that fits in that group of MHC1. It kind of stabilizes the reaction. I'll give more details later in Wednesday's lecture. But for now, well, round one is the positive selection. You can interact with MHC1, but if that red ball is a self antigen, you do not want to react to that because you would attack yourself. Okay, so. The second round of selection is um, no is good. No lives. If it's a yes, apoptosis. You don't want those because that would actually trigger an autoimmune response, so you don't want that. <coughs> okay, let's kind of pictorially review round one and round two. Here's positive selections. The T cells must recognize um, self, okay, the, the MHC thing. So what you see here is some cell that has the MHC here's the T cell and this T cell receptor is no good. It cannot interact with, it can't bind at all. Failure to recognize MHC. So no, die. Okay, this one, it, it recognizes it. It kind of binds, I say loosely binds because they leave a little gap there. This is actually good. You can recognize it enough, you survive, you go to round two. So round two is the negative selection. Look at this top picture. If you recognize MHC1 on a little capsule, if you bind too tightly to a self antigen, that would trigger an immune response in this cell. We don't, we don't want those. So the yeses undergo apoptosis. But the ones that can both recognize MHC1 
and bind less tightly so you don't react with the self-antigen, those are the ones that will enter the circulation. Okay. Uh, so any questions on the T cell education? Round one or round two? You can, uh, all right, well, uh, that's it for this lecture. All right, let's um, take a break. When we come back, we'll do uh, blood typing lab.